Historical movies. These are films based around events or times or characters of the past. My name is Smart Alec and I have a very special guest with me today. He's come all the way from England just to be here to do this video. Dan, the historical man. Daniel, what would you say your qualifications are as a historical expert? Well, I actually read non-fiction historical books. What? Uh, yeah, uh, currently reading the Chronographia, uh, the 14 Byzantine Emperors by Michael Sellis. Yep. And that, that, not many people do that. <laughs> it sounds impressive. I have no idea what you're talking about. No, but you're studying history at King's College London yes, at the moment. Yes, I am studying history at King's College London. I should note to the viewer that my list is purely based on emotion and what I, t what I consider to be great films. So I, I'm... I'm angling more towards the film side of the historical film, and I think, Daniel, am I right in saying you're angling more towards the historical side? So you've tried to pick historically accurate films as well as good films. Yes, yes. Okay. I've also sort of uh, chosen ones which are quite evocative into Ooh. a historical genre. We'll each go through our top five history films. That should give you a rough idea of the movie trailer's top ten historical movies. So without further ado, let's begin. My fifth favourite historical film of all time is Gettysburg, produced in 1993 by uh, Ronald F. Maxwell. Gettysburg is possibly one of the longest films ever made. <laughs> Um, and it documents the historical Battle of Gettysburg, which was one of, if not the most decisive battle of the American Civil War. Um, okay, how long is it? It's four hours and something like that. Well, I love this film, mainly because it is quite... It's quite, it's quite a spectacle, right? Um, there was a lot of thought put into this film, I think. There's a lot of development of the characters as the importance of this battle is uh, set throughout the entire film. Mm. Um, and also it depicts both sides of the conflict in sort of their own perspectives. So okay. you have the Union fighting to defend the Union of the United States. You have the Confederates who are fighting for the secession of the Confederate states. So the Confederates aren't just your stereotypical Yes, they are. Racists. They actually have that. They, there are several times in this film where um, you are, well, I was rooting for Confederates. I, I know. It's the... It's the <laughs> what? I don't know for saying this, but... It's almost like there's good and evil on both sides of the yes, conflict. It's almost as if they're real people <laughs> and not just stereotypical. We're looking at you, Mel Gibson. Yeah. yeah. You won't be finding any Mel Gibson films on this list. Yes. Well, in the credits, there is this gigantic list of Civil War reenactors, <laughs> and most of yeah. them were volunteers, so. They all brought the they passionate the actors, about passionate about Gettysburg. The actors were all uh, taught like the mannerisms and what they would wear. The, the Civil War reenactors helped them out. The historians on site to help the directors direct everything so that it was as historically accurate as possible hmm. and also a epic uh, war film. There are some mistakes, but. Um, in 1993, they couldn't just jump on Google and type in whatever. So. Most of the historical inaccuracies are just human error. So my number five, in the spirit of historical accuracy, is Kingdom of Heaven. I'm aware that Orlando Bloom was terrible in the lead role as Balian? Balian, yeah. Balian, yeah. Who is a real person. Yeah, but not really as they depicted. No. And I'm also aware that it has quite a lot of modern sensibility about it. Yes. However, that really didn't actually spoil the film too much for me. I feel the I think the medieval period is probably my favourite these days 
in history. I find uh, sort of the mystery surrounding because people still don't know actually that much yes. around the medieval um, and the d- medieval period. period is one of those periods when historians started when they had gaps in their histories they made it up. Yeah. I just love it. I really love that area of history. And there is a criminally small number of good medieval films. Mm. You have Kingdom of Heaven, which some people don't like. I I do. And you have Monty Python's The Holy Grail, which is a comedy. But then there isn't much else. There, there are lots of really mediocre to bad to terrible medieval films. I'd really love to see Hollywood pick up the medieval era and produce some more. Because, I mean, you have things like Black Death, which I love Sean Bean, but it's... eh. Yeah, Ironclad... Nah. Yeah, they're all pretty mediocre. Yeah. So, Kingdom of Heaven stands out because its production is incredible. The score is absolutely amazing. It's... It's at least on a par with Gladiator's score, I'd say. It definitely has a unique tone to it that I really like. And it's got some incredible support actors. You've got um, you've got David Fulis and Liam Neeson and Jeremy Irons and Edward Norton. But they're, they're just coming out of the walls yeah these incredible supporting actors the aesthetic whilst maybe it's a it's a bit gray it's unique for the film and i really enjoy that and yeah it just i think the director's cut adds in a lot if you've only seen the theatrical cut go and watch the director's cut because it gives some of the most it gives some of the main characters some key development it explains where Balian's skill set comes from, why he's a really good engineer and a really good tactician. Um, it fills in loads of plot holes, especially with Isabella, the character of Isabella, like her motives, and this whole plot succession plot line all gets filled out. It it really improves the film. It's a bit <laughs> it's a bit skewed. Yes. Like, the uh, Muslims are the uh, good side, as it were, and the Crusaders are just really evil butchers, essentially. But you know what? I, I, it doesn't really bother me that much. Mm. It's, Hollywood. it's Hollywood. There's always one side that's, you know, it's normally the English. Actually, most people there would have been French. Yeah, anyway. but they had English accents. Yeah, they were all... <laughs> so that's my number five, Ridley Scott's 2005 movie, Kingdom of Heaven. My number four is the film Cartoon. Uh, It came out in 1966 and was directed by Basil Dearden and Elliot Elferson. And this film is about a English hero from the late Victorian era, a man, uh, General Gordon. It stars uh, Charlton Heston as... uh, General Gordon, and Laurence Olivier as the Mardi. Wow. So all-star cast, then. Yeah. And um, it's a really good epic film, a a war film. Mm -hmm. Um, If you want more films like Zulu, I definitely recommend watching Cartoon. And basically, it's it's based on the uh, Mardi revolt and the siege of Khartoum, where uh, the British government sent out Gordon to try and essentially rescue the city of Khartoum from the Islamic extremists who are trying to essentially commit genocide against the Egyptians there. Mm. There are just these really great scenes where we have Charlton Heston and Laurence Olivier um, together in the same tent mm. and the the charisma of these two actors and the, the sheer might of their presence with one another is something that is just... just it seems to le- have left an impression. <laughs> <on> wordless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm, Historically but... accurate? Uh, mainly, yes. <laughs> okay. Mainly. Cartoon okay. Uh, came out in 1966. And it was the last film to be shot in Ultra Panavision before The Hateful Eight. 70 years later. There you go. My number four is actually higher on Daniel's list, so we'll both talk about that together when it comes up. (laughs) 
my number three is Schindler's List. And that was my number four, Schindler's List. It is based on a book and a real person, uh, Mr. Schindler. Oscar Schindler. Oscar yeah. Schindler, uh, played by Liam Neeson, who yeah. is a sort of German... He's a businessman. Yeah, he's trying to make him... He's trying to take advantage of the new labour force that has opened up in Germany's walls of expansion in World War Two. Yeah. And as he views the atrocities that are taking place by the Germans towards the Jews, the Polish, the anyone who wasn't essentially German. Yeah, um, his motives change. His motives change. Yeah. Would you say that um, it's historically accurate? Uh... Yes, I'd say so. Because I didn't pick this because it was historically accurate. Although I feel that that helps if that's the case. Yeah. I think this is a deeply moving film. Yes. Yeah. Needless to say, I feel like Schindler's List is a film that everyone should watch for the sake of understanding. I and mean... For the sake of not repeating our mistakes as, as a race, as a species. I mean, the, uh, the Germans uh, murdered... 11 million people and uh, although it might just seem like a figure on a piece of paper this film really brings that those uh, people that died to life the, the horrors of it yeah it is horrible you you see people being murdered for no real reason just on the spot you you see uh, people women getting abused um but it's beyond that there's, there's incredible artistry in this film as well. I love how it's shot in black and white. Yeah, and there's the, the way he highlights the one little girl with the red... Um, the red it was pink. Anyway. It was, it was a red, with a red uh, shawl or coat. That, that was really powerful because you just spot this, this little girl and it signifies some sort of a sense of um, innocence and... You see her body later in the car. Oh, yeah, really powerful stuff. It, it made me tear up. If <laughs> When we watched this last, I managed to set fire to our microwave cooking some popcorn, which kind of took us out of the mood. But even mm. despite all of that, it was still deeply affecting. Mm. I, I mean, I wouldn't rush out to watch this again. No. Excellent performance by Ralph Fiennes. Oh, Ralph Fiennes. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> you really... You really like it when he gets hung at the hand at the end. Yeah. I mean, he is absolutely detestful, but I can't help but marvel at his incredible performance because he is riveting as the villain. As well, the I, I like Liam Neeson as well. Yeah. Yeah. I would say this film's important. Yes. And you can't say that about too many films, I don't think. My number four, Daniel's number three, The Incredible Schindler's List. If you haven't seen it, please see it. Everyone should see it. Full stop. And my number three... Now, this this <laughs> is clearly inspired by Schindler's List to some extent. Yeah. And it's definitely in the style of Schindler's List. And when I was making this list, this list, I couldn't decide which one to pick above the other. I'd actually put them roughly on a par with each other. But... Right. Sorry? I know I did. Yeah, but I actually think I prefer this film, and that's 12 Years a Slave, released in 2013 by Steve McQueen. Again, marking some of the most tragic and horrible <laughs> periods of human history. Um, this was, well, this covers slavery in America. It's very frank, and one of the things I really enjoy about it is how they move away from that, that Hollywood sort of way of filmmaking. Steve McQueen's an English director, and in fact it's full of English actors, so you can rely on, you can rely on the Brits to make... A, a good film a, about America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Again, it's just full of absolutely harrowing stuff. There's a scene where Solomon Norfolk, played by Chiwetel Ejiofor, is being hung and it's <laughs> this single take and you just see time passing as he's there fighting for his life fighting to keep a toe on the ground and not suffocate 
And it's just, I've never seen anything like that. But the film is so incredibly well shot in, mm. in, in its entirety. From how tactile the way he fastens the strings on his, his violin and then the significance of that breaking near the end. Uh, just the whole film is absolutely incredible. I love it in the ship where they're making up a plan to escape and then <laughs> it's very, very abruptly ended and hope is just ended. But in a normal Hollywood film, they would fight and maybe make a getaway but in this, just no dead. And I, I really, yes. I, I thought that was impressive because it, by making it more grounded in reality, it doesn't... Not everyone has a glorious death. Yeah, and, but there is no glory in any of this. Mm. And it was really important, um, that grounded nature for making this as powerful as it was. And 12 Years a Slave is fantastic. It was the best film of 2013. And I think it deserves to be on this list, despite how recent it is. Because I think, again, like Schindler's List, this is a film everyone should watch so that we as a species don't keep making the same mistakes. So yeah, Schindler's List and 12 Years a Slave are the serious portion of my list. They're fantastic pieces of art, but they're also important from a historical and a message standpoint. So there you go. Uh, that's mm. 12 Years a Slave, my number three. My number two is El Cid, the uh, epic from 1961, uh, directed by Anthony Mann, and it is all about the life of Don Rodrigo Diaz de Viva, also known as El Cid. Cid! The Cid, yes. Cid! The Cid! Cid! The Cid! Cid! The Cid! Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> which means the Lord. <laughs> I didn't know that. No. I didn't know that. The leads, again, Charlton Heston and uh, Sophie Loren. Oh, fit. <laughs> and this is all about the life of Spain. I would say Spain's greatest hero among sort of on par with England's Nelson, I'd say, who uh, goes around Spain in a time of turmoil, uh, chaos, a time of real tension between the Christian and Muslim uh, factions in Spain, and also the massive threat of the Almoravids, which are invading uh, Iberia at this point. Okay. And um, it's a really well shot film. I I always enjoyed watching it. The sets, the production values are really great. Um, it's. It keeps very much to the story of Rodrigo, so his exile, the, the, the fight, the feud between Alfonso and Sancho, his conquest of Valencia, and you get this sort of real sort of shining light in a dark place element. Uh, Charlton Heston, again, great actor, Sophie Wren, great actress. They really make the roles their own. Hmm. I just remember watching it when we were younger. I really like that that duel between El Cid and this other knight. It's the uh, knight of the champion of Aragon. Yeah. Aragon? Aragon. Uh, the kingdom of Aragon is where the Catalans come from. Ah, uh, okay. I, I've played medieval Total War. I know where it is. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really really good film, actually. Yeah, it's a very good film. Historically accurate, though? Yes. Really? Yes. Very. Okay. Number two. Very good film. Uh, a nice historical piece of Spanish history. El Cid. Okay, so just a foreword about, about my last two films. I'd say that these are my two favourite historical films by quite a large margin. Now, I'm actually leaving off quite a lot of vaguely historical films that will probably make it onto war film lists and so forth. So if you're expecting Apocalypse Now or that sort of ilk, then you're not going to find it on this list because I feel like that's more based on a book than history. So my number two is a film that I loved growing up as a child. It was released in 1964 and it still holds up today. That is Cy Enfield's Zulu. Zulu! Zulu! <laughs> 
So this film covers the Battle of Rourke's Drift. If you haven't seen it, it's about... A hundred? A hundred and fifty men against three thousand Zulu warriors. Yeah, so forget three hundred. You know, forget the Battle of Thermopylae. This is the real deal right here. Battle of Rourke's Drift. One of the things I love about it is that they really exemplify the tactics of war in this film, but they don't allow that to take the place of good storytelling. In fact, I go one step further, they actually intertwine the tactics in this film with the drama, and that really makes it... Unlike Waterloo, for example, which basically is just a depiction of Waterloo. It is too long, and some of the decisions they made were for historical accuracy over good storytelling. Now in Zulu, one of the best things in the film is when they all start singing, and you see a clash of cultures. One side risks extinction um, in that battle. The 150 men fighting for their lives risk dying. And then you've got the Zulus who... Whilst whether they win or lose the battle, it doesn't matter, they as a people are on the verge of dying out. Yeah, you really get the sense of a clash of cultures and the end of these people, but they're paying each other respect. And it's that sort of drama that, whilst it's not historically accurate, really makes this film. And then you have the volley fire. Those are real tactics that were used by the British army um, in that period. And... It makes for engaging, intense cinema. It's really well done. One of the things I really like about this film is that they, again, they don't paint the Zulus as some vicious, Savages. savage, in, yeah. stereotypical an antagonist tribe. <laughs> this was made in the 60s. You have all the civil rights stuff going on. This, like many films of that sort of era, could have so easily been quite racist by today's standards. But I feel they did, a, they, they did a fantastic job of not doing so. And you really get a sense that these are real people and they've experienced the horrors of war. Like there's no triumph after um, they defeat the Zulus at the end. It's, there's incredible performances from uh, Stanley Baker yes. and it's... Michael Caine. They are brilliant leads in this film. They're absolutely fantastic. They give incredible standout performances. And this really is a gem that many people haven't seen. This is a true survival war story with real heroes and real emotions. And yeah, it's brilliant. I just want to say, <laughs> just want to add that the landscapes, the costumes and the picture quality is brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. I was watching clips from Epic Films the other day making uh, the channel trailer and it really does stand out. So there we go. My number two, Zulu. My number one film of all time is The Madness of King George, directed by Nicholas Haitner in 1994 it was produced and this is a story about George III King of the United Kingdom and his first uh, lapse into madness and it's based on the historical event of the Regency crisis and also it was adapted from Alan Bennett's The Madness of George III and uh, it stars Nigel Hawthorne uh, Helen Mirren, Ian Holm, and Rupert Everett. Mm. And this is an amazing film. It's, it accomplishes a lot, in not, not in about an hour and 20 minutes. It's not particularly long, but it accomplishes so much. I've, I don't think there's many films where I've been deeply moved, laughed, and had... Uh, tension build up throughout this whole thing. It provokes so many emotions. The acting hats off to Nigel Hawthorne. I, I'd say this is one of his best roles. He really brings the character of George III alive. Hmm. Um, historically accurate? Uh, mainly, yes. I'd say it's mainly historically accurate. They changed some things to make it be a better film rather than historically accurate. But yes, it is, I, I think... Um, 
one of the really great historical films and it's not very well known either. It's really underrated. My number one film is The Madness of King George. Okay. My number one was Reason 2000 and of course it's Ridley Scott Gladiator. <laughs> this is a masterpiece of a modern blockbuster. I love ancient Rome, ancient Romans. That's always been a, a period of history that's appealed to me. So the opening battle sequence alone, it really is incredible. In fact, I think they use authentic Roman uh, tactics I as think well. So. You have the legionaries and their massive shields and you have their use of uh, ballistas and archers and they're fighting these barbarians and it was my first experience of high definition watching this opening sequence when I was younger. The score is a timeless, world-beating score it certainly has that definitely been. should have won an Oscar. So you got Russell Crowe playing Maximus Decimus at really Meridius. Meridius. Is it Meridius? <laughs> Maximus. <laughs> and he's husband to a murdered wife, father to a murdered son, and he is going to have his vengeance in this life or the next. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> but he has a standout performance from Joaquin Phoenix as the evil Commodus. Now, he is incestuous and a psychopath and he Rufus. murders his father and he has a bloodlust and he loves the Roman games, the gladiatorial games and oh, I love this film so much. It has such incredible production value. I think Commodus gets more evil as the film goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, his eyes sort of darken and his skin pales yeah. more. Like. I mean, this film has great writing, great lines. Now, this is something that I think is important, and I think it goes for Schindler's List as well. Whilst you can't cover all of an area of history in a film, you may as well just make a documentary at that point. I think it captures the spirit. Mm. And I think that is really key in some of these films. It has to capture the spirit without completely bastardizing history. Like and that's Braveheart. where, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what Gladiator does. This is a classic revenge story mixed in with a classic historical story with epic set pieces. I'd also say this film has an incredible supporting cast. They have Derek Jacobi, Oliver Reed, Jimon Hansuo, uh, Richard Harris. Yeah, this is my favorite historical movie and it's perfect for what it is. If you're looking for historical accuracy, yeah. As I said, it's about the spirit. So, Gladiator is my number one. So, Daniel, do you have any honourable mentions? I do. you want to quickly bring up? Uh, I'd like to honourably mention the film Gandhi, directed by uh, the late Lord uh, Richard Attenborough, mm -hmm. um, which was very good. Uh, the Great Escape. Huh? With uh, Steve McQueen, again, Lord Richard Attenborough. Glory, Waterloo, uh, very historically accurate film, and uh, a spectacle, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Letters from Iwo Jima, which uh, is a fantastic film. Hmm. So we have quite a lot of overlap. So these, these films are all brilliant, absolutely brilliant. They just didn't make my list for personal preference, I think. So Letters from Iwo Jima, 300. From a stylistic point of view, <laughs> it, it's original, mm. excellent, and you can even get away with the historical inaccuracies, which are obvious, because this is about storytelling, and it's about uh, the point of view of the victor, or the survivors in this case, and uh, yeah, so actually it makes sense. So you could say that this is this is historically accurate because it's from the point of view of a Spartan soldier. Yeah. And you... I don't think it even paints them necessarily as perfect heroes because, you know, yeah. they talk about throwing their babies on the scrap heap if they're not perfect and stuff. So, yeah, really good film. Lawrence of Arabia is an epic masterpiece that doesn't make my list purely out of personal preference. 
but it's definitely worth a mention. It's fantastic. Mm. Uh, the Great Escape, as you said, and Waterloo, which needs to be brought up and commended for its historical accuracy. It may be the most historically accurate film ever made, but I feel it loses a few points from a filmmaking point of view, especially the start, which is very it's, low production value, yeah, very, very slow. And overblown. Yeah. yeah. So that's it. That's our greatest historical films of all time. Oh. Have you enjoyed your time here, Daniel? Will it go down in history? As one of your favourite moments of your life? It's already been written down. Ah, no, recorded. Not written. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank my guest. Daniel, thank you for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, it's been interesting to hear your list. You've picked a very unorthodox list. Well, if I did pick a more orthodox list, it would be the same as uh, Smart Alec here, so... Uh... Exactly the same? I wanted to pick a... Maybe. Okay. <laughs> give or take. Give or take. Um, okay. So well, I went for more every... evocative ones for yeah. history yeah. buffs. It's good. There you go. So Daniel has picked some films that if you are a history buff, maybe you don't, haven't heard of before. Take it from him. They're going to be historically accurate and they're going to be worth a watch. So yeah, you've seen all the ones I've picked anyway. Hopefully. If you're not, then uh, find a television yeah. and watch And please it. watch the director's cut of Kingdom of Heaven before slagging it off, because the theatrical cut was nonsense. I yes. agree with you, but you need to see the director's cut. Thank you for watching. I'd also like to give an extra special shout-out to one of our new patrons. That's Christian. You, sir are a gentleman and a class act and I really I really wholeheartedly appreciate your support um, every little really does help it's keeping the channel running and it's keeping me motivated so thank you very very much for your donation and if you want to donate or become a patron check out the comment section below and follow the links it's fairly simple to set up also we are running a poll for the People's Choice Top 100 Films of All Time. So this is going to be your picks for the greatest films ever. Not my picks, your picks. There'll be a link to the survey in the comment section below. Lots of links, but do check it out. You get to vote on your top 25 films ever. And that'll be put into a pool of everyone else's. And then I'll make a video listing them off. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. So please do that. Please become a patron. Please subscribe. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this video and check out some of our other videos. I've been Smart Alec and we've been the Movie Trialers. Goodbye for now and until next time. We're historians. <laughs> <laughs>